Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. There were days where we thought we wouldn't make it out, but we stuck it out. Today's our day. You've come to the right place. Today's our day. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. Most of what people see and hear about marriage in media are the extremes. First is the romantic view of the couple after overcoming some horrible odds riding off into the sunset. The other is that marriage requires onerous work, compromise, and sacrifice. The truth is that the happy couple just ride off into the black hole that is marriage, and that is filled with all kinds of myths and unrealistic expectations of soulmates, misery, and who knows what else. So it's no wonder that couples are confused if they made the right choice. So to clear up some common misperceptions about marriage, I'm happy to welcome back Dr. Corey Allen. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist and professional life and relationship coach. So, Corey, thanks so much for coming back on the show and talking about what seems to be, you know, this this challenge that is marriage. Correct. It is. It is a challenge. That is true. So you wrote a blog post recently titled Passion Isn't the Problem, which I loved. So. What role can or should passion play in a marriage? Well, I, Leslie, I think the better question is what role does passion play in your life? Ah, okay. <laughs> because... Yes, because we're always told to go follow our passion, follow our <laughs> bliss. Like, what does that even mean? Like, that's a bigger question. I don't know if we got time to really unpack. <laughs> um, But a lot of times what I keep finding when it comes to the marital dynamic of this equation is you're seeking something that you're not bringing to the party yourself. Mm. And if that's the case, how in the world is your marriage going to fill something that you're not providing an opportunity to do and your part in? And that's, And that's the romanticized view of marriage in a lot of ways that you alluded to in the open. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's the, you'll, you'll complete me. We'll oh. live happily ever after, <laughs> um, you know, for better, for worse. And there will all always be just better. You know, <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, no, that's not married life. <laughs> so, well, and, and I think that that's really the problem is because, you know, people buy into this. They're, they're not necessarily paying attention to what they're seeing in real life. But they are buying into this, this, I don't even know what we romanticized, I guess, would be the would be the term for it. And so it's almost as if when they're come face to face with the reality, they're shocked. Yeah, they think they think something's dramatically, drastically wrong. Uh-huh. That, and rather than I would see it as, um, you know, the moment you wake up in marriage and wonder, did I make a mistake or the moment you roll over and, (laughs) you know, sort of detest your partner (laughs) or don't like them at all because of what they did or didn't do. uh, That's when marriage begins. Oh, well, and it's, yeah, there's something deeper going on then, right? There's something else happening with both of you at that point. Yeah. It's so funny because, you know, I don't know if you get this um, question, but I get it all the time about whether or not I do premarital work. I said, yes, with anybody who's willing to do it, but most people are so caught up in this romantic haze right. that they're like, well, they usually have one of two things, either, no, you know, we're fantastic. We're not going to run into any problems. We don't need it. Or the alternative, I don't want anybody to tell me that I might be making a mistake. (laughs) You know, but then they run smack dab into reality. Maybe it's six months, a year, maybe two years in. And then they're like, what do we do now? But then they think it's normal because of all the, well, it's supposed to be hard work. You know, so how do we help people out of this? Well, I think so. First off, let's differentiate the idea of hard work, mm-hmm. um, because I don't think marriage is all that hard of work. Mm-hmm. What oftentimes uh, if you're if you're in a situation that's listening, somebody's listening to this, it's in a marriage 
where they just feel like it's a constant uphill battle. It's a, you know, you're in mud and you can't, it, it's just exhausting. Mm-hmm. It, that it, marriage isn't necessarily that. Yes. That could be because one or both of you are being very immature. And yes, you're not growing up. You're not dealing with your side of the equation. You're not facing what you are bringing to the party that's co-creating and colluding to create this struggle. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I was just working with a client today that this was the first time with them. And it was just, they were trying to say, well, what I'm really wanting is to be loved. And so I just interrupted her real quick, said, okay, so what ways are you acting lovably? Ooh. Right. <laughs> because that's the, that's where the rubber meets the road. And if I want to be respected, where am I acting respectably? Right. And because it's self-fulfilling prophecy of if I lose my cool, because I don't get what I want, I'm going to continue to not get what I want. But this is, but this plays into the thing. Well, my partner should just, you know, accept all, you know, should, should love me no matter what is, I mean, that unconditional love, right? That I can be as atrocious as possible and my partner still has to love me. There's still consequences though on everything. And, and, and marriage is still a choice. Mm-hmm. And so it's looking at it, the idea of, yeah, hopefully I can rely on some compassion from my partner, but I can't rely on them to just grin and take it all the time. If I'm dishing it out wildly and blindly, Mm -hmm. eventually somebody's got to stand up and say, hold on, I'm not going to let you treat me this way anymore. And that's a better move rather than you need to stop treating me that way. Cause that's a, that's a no power move. Exactly. And I, but, but that's what people do, or at least sometimes it's the language they use. And, and I think that that can be a critically important part of it as well is, you know, I want you to stop doing that, which is a perfectly legitimate request, but we, but for the power statement is I will no longer put up with that. Right. Right. And that, because that's, that's more uh, personal agency. Mm Mm-hmm that I am in control of my choices based on my statement Mm -hmm. and that's boundaries, right? That's the, that's that idea of it's not another person's responsibility to enforce my boundary. It's my boundary. I hope they honor it, but Mm -hmm. when they don't, I have to enforce it, not somebody else. Well, and that's where we know the rubber meets the road a lot of the times because I don't want to do what I have to do to enforce the boundaries. So the easier thing is if you would just respect it in the first place. Right. Right. Or I just, I throw a big fit and I get hurt and I get mad and, and I I'm culpable in creating a dynamic, Mm -hmm. but I continue to take the stance of it's not my fault. Yes. So wanting to get back to this concept of passion and you were talking about, well, is, is somebody, you know, if I say I want passion in my relationship, um, am I am I doing things to invite that? Am I am I putting passion into the relationship? But in your piece, you say that passion is much more complicated than what's shown by Hollywood and Hallmark and all the other you know places we get our information about romance. What do you mean by that? Well, so a lot of times it's the idea that. Um, you know, we have to, we have to kind of define what does passion mean? Because there's a lot of what life is. I mean, so (laughs) Leslie, let's, let's frame it this way. Um, I, 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 there's no, this is made up statistics. So I'm going to, I'm going to own it. Okay. (laughs) Cause I've not found any research that actually confirms this. This is just my hypothesis. All right. That 90% of life is just the treasury of what is required of us to survive. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. That it's I, I got to have a job. I got to have food. I got to have shelter, need water. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need a family in a sense if I'm going to keep, keep the species going and my namesake and my family going. Mm-hmm. You know, so that, that's just it's just what's required of this is just right. life on life terms. Mm-hmm. 10 percent houses all of the pleasures, the the joys, the romantic stuff, the passion, if you will, even uh, the really good Uh, erotic sex, you know, all of that. That's in the 10%. Okay. But we seem to think that 10% actually is that is more right. That, that there's more that, well, I'm just, I've got, 
how do I bring passion? I'm not passionate doing the dishwasher. Well, of course you're not. It's the dishwasher, <laughs> right? So what if I reframe my relationship to that dynamic in my life though? That's okay. a different framework because I was actually, I'm convinced, Leslie, I was conceived and born uh, for three reasons. And this is selling my parents short who are wonderful people, but um, I think that they had me because they needed somebody to mow the lawn, unload the dishwasher and change the channel. Cause this was before the days of remote controls. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> one of the things I detest is whenever I see the light on, on the dishwasher, uh-huh. I hate it because it still just brings back the drudgery of existence. Uh huh. So what I have done over the last two decades, and now that I have kids, they are in charge of the dishwasher more than I am, <laughs> but when they were little, we turned it into a game mm -hmm. of how fast can we unload the dishwasher without breaking anything? Come on, kids, let's go. Set the clock, go. Right. And we would just have fun with it. That's bringing passion to something mm -hmm. rather than expecting it to provide it, which is what we hope the 10% will do. And so if I can look at it as, I think in the piece, I, I listed it as its priorities and its choices, yes. right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I confront things via choice that I can make I can have a good time regardless of what's going on. If I choose so it's not what we think of as the socialized view of, of a good time necessarily, but I can still find something to glean out of it. That's fun and enjoyable. Yeah. And that's an, you know, and that's an interesting mindset. And, and, you know, I love the 90, 10 split um, because I think, you know, and, but even in that 90%, like you said, with the dishwasher, we can, we can choose to look at it as drudgery or we can choose to look at it in, in some other way. And again, that's bringing empowerment back to the individual. Um, although as you're sitting there, I'm still trying to figure out, I don't think I can bring, I don't think I can bring joy to cleaning the toilet, which is why my husband does that. Because, <laughs> well, you know. that's, that's where you're fortunate to you have someone else that maybe is more adept at bringing joy yeah. to something like that than you. So therefore that's theirs. Perfect. Yeah. He doesn't hate it anywhere near as much as I do. So Perfect. That's, yep. that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this this idea about choices and and I and I do think that that is one of the challenges of being being married. And we're going to probably talk about this a little bit more, but about the the choices of what I am going to pay attention to, um, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the things that I'm going to choose to be bothered by Um you know, and I think that's where a lot of relationships end up in the ditch is because I'm choosing to pay attention to all the negative things, which, of course, we we understand that you know, negatives are much more powerful than positives, which is right. You know, right. And 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 we're all and we're all pain avoidance. So the things that are bothering us, hurting us, whatever, the things that we want to stop. But but we but we somehow don't see our own role in that is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. I, I think that, I mean, if you're talking about marriage, I view marriage as a volunteer sport. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's not victims in it. We're volunteers. We chose it. Mm -hmm. And it's every day is a choice. And this goes back to what we were, what we were, you and I were talking about earlier of the idea of if I'm being repeatedly treated poorly, in my opinion, in some regards, if it continues, I'm responsible for yep. it. Because I haven't taught them differently. I mean, one of my colleagues early on in the therapy world, I walked into her office and she had this written real cleanly on the board because this was the theme of the day for her clients, apparently, mm -hmm. was you teach people how to treat you. Yes. And so if there's a situation going on that I feel like I'm being treated poorly, in some ways, I've taught that. And that may not be overt as in, hey, sweet, yeah, te teach me, you know, treat me this way. Most of the time, it's I've not stood up when I felt like I was treated poorly and mm -hmm. said, excuse me. No, I don't. That tone I'm not going to accept. That's a different phrase. Yes. And it's a very it's a very powerful one. And yep. and it brings back memories of a couple that I saw many, many years ago. And he would you know, call her names in, in my office. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, be like and I'd be like, stop that. 
But I actually asked her once when we were by ourselves, I said, why, when he called you the B word the first time, was it okay? And she said, well, it's not. I said, well, 12 years later, he's still doing it. So right. mm, somewhere he got the idea that, that it was. And, and it's not necessarily easy to stand up and say, this is not acceptable, because I think we're afraid of well, the consequences if I, of that. If, if I stand up and say it, I better well have the courage to follow through. Mm, yes. And that's where it gets scary. Well, well, yes, and a little bit and a little bit dicey because, sure, you know, because um, all of those things. I mean, this this is where if I've got a romanticized view of marriage, I think any major fork in the road like that, which these aren't really major yet. Mm-hmm. I, I treat them as such, though, because it's a divorceable offense, possibly. Right? Correct. What you mean? You don't want Chinese food for the sixth night in a row. <laughs> How dare you? That could ultimately lead to a divorce if you <laughs> think about it. Right. And if that's the reason for it, if they actually put that down on their paperwork, okay, well, there's probably got to be more, but it's still, we get so caught up in, I don't want to even go down that road of possibility of we may not end up together or whatever, rather than hold on. What is it you're really wanting? Mm -hmm. What are you really after? If you're wanting a partner, you got to be willing to, at the very least, admit that route exists. Doesn't mean you choose it, but it could mean you put your foot on it for a moment. Right. So this is happily ever after is just the beginning on webtalkradio.net. I'm talking passion and more relationship stuff with fellow licensed marriage and family therapist and relationship coach, Dr. Corey Allen. And if you're wondering if there's something wrong with your marriage, because you don't feel passionate about your spouse all the time, I invite you to just breathe. You're normal. And so is your marriage. Now, that's not to say your marriage has to be drudgery either. And if you're wondering if your relationship could use a checkup, and in all honesty, most of ours can, I invite you to schedule a free five-star relationship discovery session with me. You can reach me by email at leslie, L-E-S-L-I, at foundationscoachingnc.com. That's F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N-S, coaching, N as in Nancy, C as in charlie.com. Or you can reach me by phone at area code 919-924-0463. Now, I want to get back to this conversation about passion and marriage. And Corey, um, you talk about expectations. And and what role do expectations play in this focus on passion? Oh, man. Um, (laughs) There's the $64 million question, right? Well, so first off, expectations Mm. oftentimes are planned disappointments. Oh, I like that. So especially if I've got another human being involved in that Mm -hmm. expectation, I can have personal expectations that I have more agency over and power to, to use and drive towards. But anytime I have an expectation, most of what I find in married life is it's the unspoken ones. Yes. And even the spoken ones, and I have not ever examined, are they realistic? Are they even practical? Do I even really want that? What's the desire underneath it is a better question. Yeah. And I add, I add a third question to that or another question to that. Has my partner agreed to those expectations? That's perfect. I mean, there's a huge difference between expectations and agreements, right? That if I hold somebody responsible for an expectation that wasn't an agreement, I'm at fault. But, but we too. do it all the time. Yes, we do. Because our partners should read our mind, Leslie. You know that. <laughs> well, if hey, they truly on. loved us, they would just know, right, Corey? <laughs> yeah, the problem is they do know our mind and they don't care <laughs> in some regards. Well, and that's okay because there's some parts of my mind I don't like either. <laughs> and I just think a marriage happens at such a sophisticated level that we don't go deep enough to realize there are components of my life and my wants that my wife does not want and does not like, and isn't even in favor of and would not ever support. Right. Okay. That's okay. Well, but then that begs the question, where do people go from there? Because what you just described was potentially the source of really bad conflict and or resentment. 
Okay. So if, if that's the case, then the first thing you start to do is you be honest about what's going on in my life, what's going on in my relationship, what is my, what's my doing of it. And what's mm-hmm. my undoing of it in a sense, you know, what's other people's responsibility or culpability in it too. Because if I can have a better, more accurate view, it will help me reevaluate maybe what I want. Okay. Because here's the example I use all the time with, and this is the experience I use all the time too. I've actually used this twice today with clients <laughs> so far on the day of our recording this. So it's the theme of the day. It, it, well, this is the theme of a lot of them because I, I get to a lot of the issues that they are bringing up. I frame it through their sex life a lot of times because I think that's a good elicitation window. Okay. Because it helps them see how you do sex is how you do life and vice versa. Okay. And so what I see a lot of times is a husband is claiming and, and, and striving for, he wants a better sex life. Okay. Right. That's, that's what he's after. Mm-hmm. He's married to a woman that has, it's, as it's evolved, it's not that she doesn't like sex. She just is not a high on her priority list. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a check the, it's the check the box list kind of a thing, right? Right. So, yeah, I'll do this for you. And so then we start unpacking that. And I ask him the question of, okay, now you are in a dilemma, sir, of you want good sex, you claim, but what you're probably having isn't good sex, but you're not willing to admit it, are you? Ooh. because most of the time we get caught in this dilemma, but it's sex. And it's like, yeah, I get it. But there's a whole lot more going on that makes something beyond good. Uh huh. And it, cause what he was really wanting is I want my wife to be a part of it, not just obligatory. I'm like, okay, well then now you're in a dilemma of, do you accept it when she offers just that? Mm-hmm. Cause that's a dilemma. That's the same kind of thing of teaching people to treat me that I will take, I will accept your sexual crumbs is basically what he's saying. Mm-hmm. versus I'm really telling you, I want you, but uh, don't listen to that because my actions show otherwise. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that's where, that's where our language of what we start to do. Everything we do is a language for, for sure. Our sex lives. And if I can start to look at it and examine it, I'll realize. And if I can be honest, and this is where courage comes in, I'm honest about my role in it. And I'm honest about, my aspect of the resentment or the hurt or the frustration that I've got. Okay. It's not just my partner's soul doing. Mm -hmm. It's also mine. So when I change my dynamic and my dance steps, I have the possibility of changing the dance. But again, we go back to what we talked about earlier. That's the risk. There's, Mm -hmm. there's all kinds of fear in there because I don't know how that's going to be received. I don't know how they're, they're going to respond to that. Fine. Yeah. And then this is, this, this is where learning how to do that can be really helpful. And again, we don't teach people. So you also say that most of what's going on in marriage, including passion is about priorities. And I talk about priorities too. So what do you mean by that? And what can people, you know, and, and what do people need to do to actually embrace that? Well, it's, I mean, so this is, this is that kind of con- same concept of there's, there's what I say and there's what I do and where's the mm-hmm. congruence in that, mm-hmm. right? Because if I claim I am a good husband or I'm a good father, yet I am never around, mm-hmm. can I really claim that. I, yeah. I don't, I don't think I can um, because it's, it's not borne out in my actions. And so first and foremost, it becomes, if I say something I'm passionate about, or I say something I care about, but I'm not actually doing it. I need to reevaluate. Am I passionate about it or why am I not doing it? Because if it is something I'm passionate about, then I have to have, make the priorities to make it happen because there's finite things that go on in life, right? (laughs) Yeah. We only get 24 hours in a day. That's it. Yep. And, and so it's recognizing I've got to make choices and I always, and that's the thing I hear all the time and you probably do too of, yeah, but I don't have time for, well, okay, hold on. <laughs> you, anything else that's important in your life, you figure out a way to fit it in, don't you? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well then okay. I guess this isn't that important to you then. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a client many years ago who said my marriage is important, but I said, now you're going to tell me why that's not a true statement. Yep. Because, and again, it was about committing you know, time to it. And, and I think that that's one of the things that, 
that we struggle with. And it actually also kills, in my opinion, it kills the passion that's in marriage because we're ignoring it. We right. stick it on the back burner. It's okay, whatever that means. It's not that bad, whatever right. that means. But, you know, and, and these other things become more important and it dies what I call the death of a thousand cuts. Yep. Right. So that's, that's that idea of if, if I, if I'm back to the way we started this whole conversation, Leslie, of if I'm not bringing something to the marriage that I'm wanting out of the marriage, I am at fault. So how do I reevaluate my priorities Mm -hmm. to make sure what I'm bringing? Okay. So this is the way I think this is the easiest way to frame it too, is um, I can, I have figured out over the 28 plus years of marriage to my wife, I'm the higher desire for sexual frequency. Mm -hmm. I have figured out all the ways to increase the likelihood she will respond positively to sexual innuendos, overtures, in- mm-hmm. invitations, etc. Mm-hmm. None of those things work, though, for being wanted. I can't manipulate that. All I can do is present something I believe is worth wanting. Okay. And see if she ch- and see if she chooses it. So if what I'm wanting is a deeper more passionate marriage with my spouse, I have to take the risk of presenting what I believe is deeper and more passionate and see if my wife wants to join me on that journey. See if she chooses it. Mm-hmm. That's the risk. Yeah. But that is also where we get the best depths of marriage because then we actually get to experience feeling chosen and feeling cherished and feeling loved, not just obligatory kind of things. Right. Yeah. Not just habit. Right. Um, You know, and I think, you know, and I think so. And I know we. this is a conversation for another day because we're not going to have time to tackle it today. But, you know, this is one of those things where and maybe it is about priorities. Maybe it is about focus. Maybe it is about other things not being quite so scary. But we don't treat other aspects of our lives the way we do marriage. I mean, if if a lot of times we treated our jobs like we treat our marriages, most of us would be unemployed. <laughs> right. You know, it's it's doing enough to, quote unquote, get by. Right. Um, and, you, and and as you were describing, you know, um, the comp, you know, the I don't know if you've actually had the conversation with your wife or the just imaginary conversation with your wife about wanting to be chosen. What do you do when people say, well, yeah, you know, I, I hear you, Corey, that I need to step up. But what about my partner? <laughs> <laughs> what about him? But, um, but, but they're they're not doing it, too. OK, and so you're going to just play stalemate because you're going to have them hold you hostage. Okay, I'll be a hostage as long as you choose then. Because that's, I, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> well, but that's the whole thing is I think it's, it's just recognizing how do, we, how do we get to the point where I see my part in all of it. And when I empower myself to change that, I don't know if my partner will change with me or not. Mm-hmm. But the likelihood is, is if we've put any time together, this is the truth I've come across most all of the time with my couples I work with that if they've, if they've built something together in life and one person really goes down this betterment, passionate, more vibrant kind of living choice and life Mm -hmm. path, a partner is going to join you on that. They're not going to just let be left behind because that's that component of us of like, I don't want to feel like I've been left behind. Right. That mm-hmm. it motivates us like, no, 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 you're not, you're not getting out of this without me, you know? And, and so it's just the risk isn't as much as I make it out to be in my own head. And so a lot of times if I'll just make the move, if I'll speak up, if I'll, if I'll live my truth and it's incongruence, my partner will receive that. Mm-hmm. And then a lot, then most of the time, they'll start to realize, okay, hold on. Something's changing. I want to, I want to be a part of that. I want to, what do I need to do? And th- then they're asking better questions. Yeah. And, and the thing that, the thing that I would add to that, um, 
is the sooner that one party takes this step, the better for the relationship. Because sometimes one person can take that step and it's too late. Sure. But I, th- I think, and maybe we, we might differ on this, Leslie, and that's completely okay. But I think we take these steps a lot throughout marriage. Okay. I think, that, I think we, we go through levels of we grow and then we get into a comfort cycle for a while. Uh-huh. And then we grow again. And we get into a comfort cycle and then we grow again. I mean, that's the way toddlers learn to walk. Uh-huh. That's the way we learn to ride a bike. It's the way we learn to drive a car. And you realize each of those get more and more risky, right? Of, of damage that uh-huh. could be done. Well, marriage is in that boat for sure. Okay. There's a lot of damage that can come from every growth cycle, but there's damage that comes from not growing too. Yes. And, and I think you and I would agree that there's more damage that comes from not growing than taking the risk to grow. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause then you so, start holding other people hostage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what would you recommend for people who are listening, who go, okay, Corey makes sense. Um, how do I do this? <laughs> Um, you ask yourself some serious questions, and I've, I've landed on this the last couple of years from a colleague. He's the one that gave me the framework of what's my culpability and what's most frustrating in my marriage. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, it, and let that sit and realize, okay, what's your part in it? And, and when you can realize your culpability and then do something different accordingly, you change your dynamic completely. Yeah. And, and that is such a critical thing. And, you know, I, I tell people when I work with them, it's like couples work is not really couples work. It's simultaneous individual work. (laughs) Yeah. Because, because, you know, but it is, we have a built in scapegoat that if my partner would just do X or stop doing Y, everything would be great. And the harder part is looking in the mirror going, and I'm participating in this how. Right. Right. Okay. What is it that they need to satisfy for me? So I feel better about me rather mm-hmm. than how do I just start to feel better about me and confront me better? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> that, that is, that is the question. And it's actually, and I'm kind of laughing because, you know, I, you know, it's ironic because it's true. I mean, this, the only person we have any control over is ourselves. And when we are willing to step up and take a, closer, even though it might be a hard look at ourselves, that's when everything in our life can change, including our marriages. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's th- This is the phrase I use all the time with clients is what's my next best self-respecting move? Oh, I like that. So Corey, can you tell people how they can learn more about you, um, where they can, because I know you write all the time and I know you also have a podcast. Yeah. So my Online home is smrnation.com, which that's the initials for Sexy Marriage Radio, which is the podcast uh, I've been doing for a decade now. Um, And we have new shows every Wednesday. Every show is there. You can also find the podcast on any uh, podcast platform that's Mm -hmm. out there pretty much. Um, Okay, great. My wife is my co-host. We have guests that come on, and there's thou- there's over a thousand articles on smrnation.com. There's courses that are one a new one just came out, and there's new ones coming. So there's all kinds of resources available to help with this framework and help people just be better. Well, terrific, because you know passion is great, but it isn't self-sustaining. And yes, it can keep you motivated when things get challenging, but you don't always have to feel passionate about something to put effort into it. Sometimes that effort will create or reignite the passion because as we've said, love and marriage are not spectator sports. If you want to keep them alive, you have to get in the game. So I hope one of the ways that you will get in your marriage game is to continue to listen to this show. And until next week, stay loving. 